Great. Well, well, thank you very much for the kind words and and also for the invitation to come speak with all of you. Um, and as mentioned, I'm currently in Germany because I was attending the UN um, climate negotiations, which took place here over the last two weeks, and I'm now speaking at another conference tomorrow. So, um, so, it's, but it's a great pleasure that that I can join you remotely, and um, and thanks for putting up with remote speakers. <laughs> um, in 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 uh, yeah, I know it can be frustrating. So I'm here, I think largely, I know that <clears throat> over the next few days and you'll be working on looking for kind of global solutions to some of the world's most pressing problems. But you know, a large focus is for you is climate change. And that's what I've been asked to speak about. And um, I know I'll briefly I'll share my screen. I have a presentation prepared. Uh, which focuses partly on some solutions and partly on the science, because as was mentioned, I'm a lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change and was one of the lead authors of the most recent report that came out in March this year. So I thought it might be useful, even though I'm sure many of you are have in-depth knowledge as well, but just to, to give you a highlight of what that the main findings of that report uh, was and, and then to dive into some of the work I'm doing with the UN on solutions to a small, a small slice of the problem. But let me share this. And if you have um, met art, if there's anything that you in particular want me to focus on, then, then let me know. I'm also happy to answer questions at the end or, or skip through um, some things if everybody has a solid foundation already and it will be boring. Uh-oh. Oh. Can you see the... the... Yes. Perfect. It's... Sorry. Thank you. It, we can see it. Okay. So yeah, let me just move on then. So I'm sure um, many of you have um, heard of the, the latest findings of the IPCC and it has been described by some and uh, in this cartoon, it depicts it as well as an atlas of doom uh, in terms of the dire predictions of what the world is likely to face in, in the next, in the future, but the next uh, hundred years. But I'd like to, and obviously all of you are looking at solutions and your focus is how, what do we do about some of the problems that we face. And so uh, I'd like to move to this quote by another um, leader, a famous leader, uh, Desmond Tutu from South Africa. And obviously we have a global community joining us in this discussion. So for those of you from Africa, you're obviously very familiar with, with Desmond Tutu. And he said that hope is being able to see there is light despite all the darkness. And so I hope that in this, um, presentation, I can also share some, some light with you about options going forward. So I'll briefly give you some details on the IPCC, partly because this is something that you might want to engage with in future yourself. Um, and and then, then I'll highlight um, where we are in greenhouse gas emissions, the impacts and future risks, and particularly focusing on you know vulner those that are the most vulnerable. And then um, I'll ask the question of what we can do and, and highlight work from my office therein. So the IPCC um, has three different working groups. There's a working group that focuses on the physical science. There's a working group that focuses on impacts and adaptation, and another group that focuses on mitigation, so how we reduce uh, greenhouse gases. And it's been running for almost as long as I've been alive, and I'm sure as long as many of you have been alive. So we're already in the sixth assessment cycle. Um, and and that means that there's been an extensive body of work that's been previously published, but they essentially publish a series of reports every five to six years. And so the last cycle just finished and there were three special reports, one on land and food security, another on oceans and the cryosphere, and one on the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees global warming and, and potential impacts and, and how to how to get to those levels so that directly informs policy. And then there are the three special the three working group reports on the physical science, adaptation, and mitigation. And these um, reports are assembled by scientists and practitioners from around the world. So they have 200, for example, in one of the reports, there were over 270 authors from 67 countries and both from the global, from developing and developed countries. And 
approximately 41% women and 60% men. And they reviewed over 34,000 scientific papers. So the reports are essentially giant literature reviews and everybody's volunteering their time. Um, so it, it, it's a very um, time intensive process that takes several years. And, and they, you know all the authors respond to government reviews. And for those of you who are interested in engaging in this, you can engage by reviewing the documents and adding your own comments. Uh, you don't have to be a government member to do that. Anybody who has some background and, and academic expertise can do that. You can engage as an author by contacting your country's focal point. Um, and you can also engage as a review editor that basically tries to make sure that this is done correctly. So what did the latest series of reports find? Well, they found that um, obviously, uh, well, there's a lot of tension on climate change, unfortunately, we're not doing enough. And on average, greenhouse gas emissions are the highest level in human history. I think you, you probably all know this. So apologies if, if this is repetitive. But in 2019, emissions were about 12% higher than they were in, in 2010. And here you see a breakdown of different types of gases. Obviously, the majority are, are CO2 from the fossil fuel and from industry, but there are also other gases that are, are, are contributing to green up to, to emissions, and that's methane, nitrous oxide, et cetera. And land use is obviously a very big, important area. And emissions have grown in most regions, but they're also um, distributed unevenly. And since, again, we have a global um, audience here, I think it's important to highlight that you have historical emissions, and that obviously differs between regions. And some of the historical emissions, if even if you break it down by country, are often based not necessarily on industry or oil use, but things like land use. And, and Brazil and Indonesia, for example, have quite high um, historical emissions, largely to do with land use and, and deforestation rather than, than oil per se. But then we also can look at, so we can look at cumulatively, but you can also look at it per um, total population by region. And then things start to shift as well. So obviously you have some countries that have very small populations, but relatively high emissions. And here you can see, for example, the Middle East starts popping up as you do per population um, there in Eastern Europe um, and Central Asia, for example. So, so you can slice the pie in many different ways, but certainly it is in terms of equity, um, there are, are big differences in, in distribution, both historically and today. Um, now, we know that limiting warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees will involve rapid and deep reductions in most cases. And current pledges, those are the nationally determined contributions, aren't getting us there. So you can see from this, they're not even really getting us to 2 degrees, um, let alone 1.5. And the truth is that we've already, uh, the best estimate from global warming is that we've already risen, temperatures have risen approximately 1.1 to 1.2 degrees since 2020, as you can see here. But uh, that obviously differs in, in some areas of the earth and certainly over land, for example, we actually have much higher air temperatures already. So you can see the global mean surface air temperature over land is already past 1.5 degrees. And in parts of the world, um, for example, the north, um, the Arctic and whatnot, we um, temperatures have risen much, much more strongly. And we also know that obviously not just temperatures are rising, but uh, um, so we have CO2 concentrations changing, but we have sea level rise that is the fastest in 3,000 years, Arctic sea ice disappearing and the lowest in 1,000 years, an unprecedented glacial retreat. So one can say that while climate change will obviously impact the future, it isn't the future, it is the reality of today. And we have more extreme heat, heavier rainfall, drought, fires, and oceans that are acidifying. Uh, and in my office, I work with the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs as the climate science lead. And we deal with, um, over the past, since 2006, my office um, holds some of the, the biggest funds for emergency response where governments around the world contribute money to um, and pool their resources so that if there is a war or an earthquake or extreme rainfall or, or a drought, 
um, funding can be released to address these. And since 2006, um, about a third of each year, at least a third of the funding goes towards climate related events and sometimes as much as, as 50%. So it is a major um, humanitarian um, issue currently. So going with that, what are the impacts of all of this? Well, we know that it's global warming has caused um, widespread disruption in nature. Here you can see uh, tree die-offs in California as a result of drought. And the, this IPCC Working Group 2 report articulates this in the, the impacts in detail. So if you are interested, you can go and look at that uh, report. They have a summary for policymakers. And, and here's a figure that shows by region the impacts on water scarcity and food production or health and well-being for cities and settlements. And it shows whether or not there's evidence of adverse in impacts, evidence of both positive and negative impacts, and what the confidence level is. And you can see that in many places, particularly related to cities, settlements, and infrastructure, health and well-being, uh, it's highly negative. And in other places, such as food production, obviously in some parts of the world, uh, there can be some ben temporary beneficial aspects, but on the whole, it's often um, very adverse. And the, the synthesis report that was released in March, which I referred to, then it looks at what's going to happen in future. So we know there are impacts today, but what, what do we predict for the future? And I'll just highlight a few of the results from the uh, through visualizing this through figures, but we know that um, People today of different ages, there's interge There's not only um, issues of equity between countries, but it, but I really think it's important to stress that we shouldn't see this as a global north versus global south issue. Um, it really is an issue um, that differs between individuals, both between the rich and the poor in each country, uh, with the wealthy around the world, the top 10% of the wealthiest people in the world are contributing to 50% of the emissions. So it is a class issue. Um, and it's also an intergenerational issue that children born in 2020, so I have a daughter who's born in 2020, her future, and you can see this at the top, uh, when she's 70, she will be, very, it's very likely that she'll be living in a world with extreme temperatures, much more so than I will ever face or than her grandmother will ever face. So there's, yeah, there's actually scientific studies now that look at not only temperatures, but the impacts, potential risks by region to different individuals in different groups, age groups, um, in relation to extreme um, weather as well. So droughts and fires and floods and things like that. So it's it's definitely uh, um, the, the school strikes for climate that are well justified. And here we see some, um, this is another figure from the synthesis report that shows the impact, um, of course, some of the, the vulnerability issue of that those who are most vulnerable, uh, and those. this is at the country level, of course, not the individual level, but the country level, um, countries that are most vulnerable have often contributed the least to, um, to, the, to the emissions. So, um, Getting into future impacts, um, the synthesis report explores um, or highlights that in future going forward, we obviously expect that hottest day temperature change will 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 be there'll be marked variations and increases. Soil moisture will change around the world. Precipitation will change around the world, and and you're welcome to look further into into these details, but just to zoom in on one, here you can see again uh, what the world would look like at 1.5, 2, 3, or 4, uh, 4 degrees. And, and currently with the um, emissions pledge reduction pledges and the nationally determined contributions, we're likely headed to a 2.8 degree world, so closer to the 3 degree mark um, than the 1.5 world. And you can see that there, there's, there's relatively extreme changes. Uh, and obviously, those are the exchanges in the extreme in the in the extreme weather. But what does that? What are the impacts in terms of lives, in terms of biodiversity? And the IPCC goes into that as well. Uh, you can take a look and see um, the projections of biodiversity loss at different levels of warning warming. And we also have projections and things such as um, 
risks to human health as, as a result of heat and humidity. And we obviously know that there are limits to um, the human ability to tolerate heat and humidity. And in many places of the year, so you see here, days per year where the combined temperature and humidity conditions pose a risk of mortality to individuals, with the purple being all year round. Uh, and obviously, the, the kind of brown, yellow being, you know, 100 days, which if you think about that, it's a third of the year. And that's a very large portion of the globe um, in the 2.8 um, kind of middle section. Uh, so, so we do have serious risks to, um, to, to everyone really in large portions of the year. So how does the IPCC define risk? Well, just to quickly um, flag that risk is defined as the interaction between the hazard itself. So that might be, for example, the heat wave, but also vulnerability. And this is this is a, a, a big thing. So whether or not I mentioned um, wealth as a factor of vulnerability. So, for example, are you able to um, afford air conditioning? Do you not have air conditioning? So the vulnerability is factors, socioeconomic factors that influence vulnerability also add to risk and interplay with the hazards. And then the exposure. So things, for example, um, are, do you have cities that are, do you have large urban um, areas that are on uh, the coastlines? So obviously that exposure will increase the risk levels or are, is your um, uh, population less exposed because they live somewhere else? And the IPCC considers all these things when making these kind of risk assessments, and they <clears throat> visualize risks through something called burning embers. And it's basically um, almost similar to a traffic light or where, you know, red means you've got a problem or stop. And the burning embers, white means that the science doesn't show any impact in this system from climate change. Yellow would indicate that there is some evidence in the scientific literature that something is changing in the system. So for example, for looking at food security, it would indicate that the scientific literature is showing that a certain temperature, food maize production, for example, is declining or will decline. Maybe you could still, maybe it's not a very significant decline, so it's just detectable, but it's, it's kind of a moderate risk. At a high, red is a high risk, so that would indicate a temperature at which there is very widespread impact, maybe it's over a large portion of the globe, or it's a very significant decline in, in yields. And purple indicates the fact that likely there is an irreversible um, uh, impact. So losses and damages, for example, or something you can't adapt to. For example, maybe it will simply no longer be possible to grow maize in this region at this temperature level, and, and you need an alternative source of livelihood or, or food. And the IPCC, so there's a lot of burning embers in their reports. And for a lot of different, they look at biodiversity, they look at, um, as I mentioned, food security or risks from wildfire. And here we see um, health, for example, under different um, temperatures. So they have, for example, heat-related morbidity is one category, ozone-related morbidity, changes in malaria, or changes in dengue and other um, vector-borne diseases. And what you have is... Um, three different scenarios for each of these categories. One is in which we take no adaptation, so we don't do anything to try to adapt to this. The other one is where we do incomplete adaptation, so that's kind of some planning, maybe some moderate investment in health systems, but we, we don't really have the resources to do very much. And then there's the, the third category is proactive adaptation, which means that you've really invested, for example, in your health system and in ensuring that that there are, um, for example, in relation to heat waves, that there are cooling centers or places people can go if it gets really hot. And you can see that, that actually um, the adaptation actions that limit vulnerability or exposure can um, minimize the risk. So where we have proactive adaptation, even at two degrees of warming, it's still yellow, which means the risk, there's probably a moderate risk, but something we could probably deal with at two degrees. And where you have limited adaptation, in many of these systems, it's already red. So you're expecting high impacts, potential mortality, et cetera. Um, and so that the, the point here is that many of our solutions, 
don't only need to be, obviously we do need to take measures to reduce the greenhouse gases, but measures, development measures that also result in um, reduction of, of vulnerability or exposure are also important in helping limit risks at, at different temperatures. And the final um, thing I'll maybe mention about risk, <clears throat> because I know you're studying many you know, elements of not just climate, but other aspects of the SDGs, is the IPCC this in this report cycle really began to explore the issue of compound and cascading risks. So one of the challenges we know that, for example, you might have a drought um, in one part of the world, but the impact might be felt somewhere else. So uh, a wheat importing country, or another example would be um, not even a climate related example, but um, with Ukraine and, and the conflict with Russia, we've had obviously significant impacts on food um, export from one of the bread basket regions of the world. You have countries such as Somalia that are currently dealing with drought that are also heavily reliant on um, the availability of, of imported food. And when the food prices go up elsewhere, be it as a result of a climate hazard or not a climate hazard, can affect regions and, and people very far away. And here's another example where they're saying that extreme heat and drought can combine to reduce the soil moisture, but also impacts labor capacity. And both of these will reduce the food yield and result in reduced food security and, and that the, the cycles are very complicated. And here again is just to do with the, the food price, just the indication of how other non-climate related um, uh, crises can impact uh, and uh, compound many of the, the risks that we um, are experiencing in the world today. And this is just some statistics about um, the uh, kind of reduction or potential reduction of, of um, different types of food as a result of conflict in, in Europe currently. And now what does this mean on the ground? Obviously many of you um, are, are uh, have firsthand experience. So I don't think I need to go into much detail, but I just wanted to highlight in the humanitarian sector, some of the complications that we face as a result of of climate change. So South Sudan is one of the, is I believe the world's uh, youngest country um, and uh, has experienced um, since its independence, um, ongoing conflict. And as a result, uh, there are um, many people who are displaced internally within the country. And this is a, a IDP camp called Bentu in the North of the country. And it's, uh, has about 100,000 people and has uh, existed for about a decade as a result of, of, of conflict that's occurring um, in, in Unity State. And here's a image from, from the camp last year when I was visiting. Now the challenge is, and this obviously the conflict itself is an ongoing conflict is, is already an issue. But for the last three years, this area of South Sudan has been flooded and inundated by flood water. And that water is as a result, uh, partly due to likely increased rainfall over the African Great Lakes that might be climate related. It also is likely as a result of issues with environmental management and the dredging of the Nile and kind of a backlog of water that that might have accumulated due to lack of dredging of the Nile for the past 40 years. But whatever the reason, you have um, 100,000 people that are now entirely surrounded by water, living in essentially an IDP camp island. Um, and this is what it looks like when you go visit this camp that was formerly surrounded by land. And it's now you have people canoeing and these dirt dikes that have been created by peacekeepers that are the only thing separating 100,000 people from flood waters. And these flood waters do not recede, that's standing water. And every year you have rainy seasons where you have more and more water. And, and the problem is that when you have, for people living on the ground, given that they're living in a, in a situation where there's often conflict as well, they often have to choose which is worse, is the conflict or the, or the water. And and, and their solution space is really, and we're talking about solutions, you know, it's important to consider these cascading and, and, and compound risks because often when you have two things, so this is a quote from one community member that we interviewed, 
you know, you have to choose between staying in place and your formerly safe place that's now in water or moving to a place that potentially you would face conflict. And, and this person was saying that people choose to live in the water rather than die because they had to move. Um, and this is how the UN then tries to reach some of the people, community members who haven't left and they go out in these kind of submersible vehicles to distribute food. So, you know, kind of, if you're looking at that kind of very complex landscape and trying to identify solutions of what we can do, and obviously um, when I mentioned issues of equity and justice and you have a geopolitical context today that isn't necessarily favorable to um, working together collectively to find solutions and, you, you know, in the bond climate negotiations, things ground to a halt because nobody could agree to really work together, what do we do? I think this is where maybe the ray of light comes in. Um, the IPCC report concludes that there are options now across every sector, and that's both in mitigation and or the broad categories of mitigation and in adaptation that can really make a difference. So for mitigation, um, so the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, for example, they say that we can have emissions by 2030 by looking at things such as demand, food demand, demand of services, changing demand, but also changing you know, the way that we do transport or design buildings, land use, energy, et cetera. And I'll go into some of the details here. Um, the synthesis report has a figure that articulates some of this in detail. So again, if you're interested, I ref you should take a look at that. But it looks at different um, systems. So for example, energy supply or land, water, and food. And then on the right-hand side, you have the mitigation options. And these are all mitigation options that cost less than $100 per ton of CO2 equivalent. So they're, they're in broad terms, considered affordable. And you can, and then they have, they show their potential, the different options, the potential contribution to net emissions reductions. So you can see that solar energy, wind energy and expanding that has a huge potential contribution, um, but also other things um, such as geothermal or hydropower, you can also do things like just reduce the conversion of natural ecosystems, carbon sequestration, agriculture, using things such as biochar can have huge impacts at a rel relatively low price. Uh, and it goes on. And then on the left-hand column, we look at kind of uh, adaptation options. So if you're interested less in mitigation, but more what, how do we adapt? It shows some options there, such as for energy, improving water use efficiency. Um, that's to do with kind of uh, geothermal and hydropower as well, uh, or the way that we use water and energy production, uh, or creating resilient power systems. So if there are heat waves, that there aren't surges where, um, you know, you don't have power and then you have a heat wave. Uh, and it also highlights the um, synergies between these actions and mitigation. So there are many things we can do that would have co-benefits, for example. <laughs> so just getting back to the, as I indicated in um, the mitigation, obviously renewable energy generation is a key area and it's increasingly price competitive. And so while we do have these doom and gloom scenarios that I highlighted um, of what will happen in the world at four degrees or you know higher, um, I think it's important to note that the spread of um, renewable energy actually means that many of our worst case scenarios are no longer really realistic. So it's useful to, to con, you know, have those images that I showed you and consider them as a worst case scenario, but know that it's unlikely to happen unless as one um, IPCC co-chair said, unless you actually go around and rip off solar panels at this point. So, so it really has been some positive movement in both the cost and the general use of, of some of these. And for adaptation, we know that there are options that we can take to reduce risks to people in nature. I mentioned that, you know, focusing on how we can reduce vulnerability and exposure is a big part, but there are other things um, across different sectors. For example, we know that a large portion of the world is going to be living in cities. And uh, so it's really important that we design cities appropriately, both in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also ensuring that that space is livable and nature-based solutions, establishing green and blue spaces, urban agriculture, 
culture are highlighted as areas that the IPCC um, you know, notes as being very important. And there'll be a special report on cities coming out in the next few years as well, where there'll be more details provided. And for those of you um, who are, you know, again, more broadly, how does this relate to the SDGs? The IPCC reports also um, highlight uh, the kind of synergies, not just between mitigation and adaptation, but many of these things. So in this figure here, you have urban and infrastructure systems, and you can look at how green infrastructure, it's in the kind of middle, but towards the right-hand side of the screen, it has investing in green infrastructure could also have positive benefits for a variety of SDGs, be it clean water and sanitation to decent work and economic growth to reducing inequality, et cetera, et cetera. So it's important to, to try where possible to invest in, in solutions that can have multiple benefits. And now just to, to turn a little bit more about what my office is doing. So as I mentioned, we focus mainly on adaptation and loss and damage. So how do we respond to disasters and ensure that we help those that are most vulnerable um, and prepare for and adapt to climate change? And one of the areas that we've been looking at is um, anticipatory action. So how do we make sure that people can take action before a heat wave or before a flood? Um, and traditionally what happened was that you had a crisis. So for example, a flood, and then there's an assessment of needs and you plan what you're gonna do. And then there are calls for funding, for example, or for, for money so that we can address the famine and then the aid is delivered. But this can take you know six months and it's often far too late and lives have been lost and, and damage has been, has been done. And so in anticipatory action, we try to act ahead of the hazard uh, to ensure that we minimize the impacts. And in general, uh, you use early warning systems or a forecast that will say, we have now we have six month seasonal forecasts, for example. So you could say that there's gonna be a failed rainy season. Um, and then you will, so you, you identify what forecast you're gonna use. You identify what activities will be taken. So everybody has to pre-agree on activities that would minimize the impacts. And then you also prearrange the financing. So that's where my office often comes in and says, if you, you know, stakeholders in the Philippines can agree on what you'll do in advance of a cyclone, uh, we will release money based on a forecast. And then right now we've, we're working, these are the case studies where we've worked uh, across 13 countries and uh, these frameworks have been designed and $89 million were released over the past three years from the Central Emergency Response Fund. And we've been studying the impact and trying to document um, does this type of um, financing, anticipatory financing, offer a solution. And so I showed you the, um, you know, the images from South Sudan. And I was there because we were trying to figure out, can we create an anticipatory framework in a country where you have very limited forecasts and where you have conflict and um, we were able to, obviously in some ways, it's already late because the water was there, but we were able to act in advance of the rainy seasons to ensure that money was released for the next rainy season to strengthen the dikes, distribute medical equipment to reduce cholera, potential cholera outbreaks and whatnot. And um, so here's some photos of some of the, the digging that was going on as a result of the financing that was released in advance of the refugee camp being completely inundated and, and flooded out for the IDP camp. So as I mentioned, the components are that you need a trigger. So you need to agree on um, what forecast or, or what signal you'll use, the set of conditions that will alert you to an upcoming event. Um, and, and at what specific time, oh, uh, sorry, I hope you can still see my, uh, yes. <clears throat> um, you'll act. So here in the case of Bangladesh in 2020, we um, acted in advance of floods and we had stage one was a pre-activation or readiness trigger. It's so often this is, occurs when you have maybe a forecast that isn't, you know, 100% it's going to happen. It might be low probability. Um, so often forecasts that are, you know, longer are less certain. So here it was 10 days out um, and they wanted something that was a 50% probability that there was going to be a flooding that was a once in a five year flood. 
And that occurred and some money was released so that different government entities or non-governmental organizations could start to mobilize action. And then stage two is a trigger that says, okay, we're actually, we've reached this, this danger level. And so this was five days before the flood um, that there was a stage two trigger and a full amount of money was released. And so in 2020, when my agency did this, here you can see a timeline and historically, um, you know, this is the previous year in 2019, there was a flood and money was released 35 days after and cash interventions and food interventions or health interventions came 100 to 120 days after. And in 2020, the you had cash released 14 days before the flood and then, or the money the, the, from the emergency response fund was released 14 days before the flood and the actual cash distributed to people three days before the flood. So you can see it really moved the timeline forward. And some of the interventions that were given were, as I said, unconditional cash, water store, tight storage containers to preserve seeds, animal feed, hygiene and dignity kits for women and transgendered people. And we then did uh, an evaluation to look at does this have a, an Im did this have a positive impact and it was both uh, qualitative using interviews and quantitative and and the qualitative this is a quote from a woman that said you know talking about how she benefited from having um, the hygiene kits and that when there is a flood and you're displaced you often um, aren't able to access those things and and so she felt like it gave her a sense of dignity. And this is a imp results of a impact evaluation that um, was done on the cash transfer component. So families got $54 um, and it was looking at before the flood and is looking at, did this actually um, increase um, prevention activities or reduce asset losses? And uh, 6,000 beneficiary households were studied against 2,000 control households and they were interviewed by by um, phone. And the key results were that beneficiaries were more likely to evacuate um, both people and livestock, and they lost fewer assets. They were less likely to borrow post flooding. Um, and if they did borrow, they often had um, more favorable loan conditions. And they also experienced higher food um, consumption 10 weeks, 10 weeks afterwards. So the conclusion being that they most likely recovered more quickly. So I'll, I'll stop there, but just to note that, you know, going back to the IPCC, they conclude that the path forward is clear in terms of, again, since you're solutions lab and you're looking at solutions space, we do have tried and tested options available. And in the case of adaptation, there have been many countless pilots around the world um, that have uh, been tested in different contexts. And obviously we need to continue to design um, and test things for diverse contexts and, and identify solutions for, for the many different challenges that, that people might face, both in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and adaptation. But I think the biggest challenge we face or the big, biggest solution we need is how do we actually scale some of the things that we know work? So we know that, for example, solar energy, wind energy is going to be critically important. Um, things such as electric vehicles in, in the adaptation space. We know that anticipate, we know we have forecasts that we can use to act early. How do we ensure that we can scale these kind of pilots and anticipatory action? So it's not just, you know, 600,000 people in Bangladesh benefiting, but it's the entire population, you know, that is able to act in advance. Um, and I think that that is really the one of the biggest challenges that we face now in, in the next kind of decade. So I'll end with a quote by an American poet and obviously a youth uh, activist, Amanda Gorman, who said uh, that there is always light if we're only brave enough to see it, if we're only brave enough to be it. So I'll stop there and maybe answer any questions that you might have, but thanks for, for bearing with me and listening. So, um, Dr. Summers, thank you. Uh, thank you for the, what, comprehensive, scary, frightening view of um, some of the things happening on our world, the climate change.
situation, but also thank you for the light that you brought into the situation at the end. There are things that we can do, that, you know, they're real, they're here, they're now, and they need to be implemented and scaled and spread throughout the world. Um, that hopeful vision of the possible options we have um, is incredibly important to everybody in the world, especially those who, like this group here at the lab, who are trying to make a difference. It's essential to see that light. Um, your work is incredibly important. You're saving lives um, all over the place, all over the planet, and uh, we're, that's inspiring. Thank you for not just sharing what you did with us today, but your, your everyday job. Um, it's incredibly important. I have a um, question for you um, having to do with um, one of the, while we're waiting for other folks to add to the chat and their questions, my question has to do with, you know, one of the measures of the climate change impacts um, you know, there's all sorts of measures to, you know, measure what's going on, CO2 in the atmosphere and all that. I'm, my question has to do with human beings. One of the long-term trends, you know, from, what, the year 1900, average life expectancy in the world was around 45, and then it went up to the present day, and it's above 80 in the developing parts of the world. Um, what do you see, I mean, that's a long-term trend going up, uh, and the disasters of climate change that you described to me seem like, okay, that's going to level off and go down. Uh, is that your assessment as well? If, if we don't act uh, in the way that you and I and other people would like to see us act, meaning immediately full-scale, uh, how do you see that impacting life expectancy? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, um, and there are, I believe, some scenarios, this gets into the kind of the, the climate science itself. There are some scenarios that start modeling this, and I'd have to probably check back and look at what they say about life expectancy in, in some of, you know, these areas. Um, uh, yeah, I would probably say that, I mentioned the inequality partly because I, I always, you know, I think that the tragic, maybe the, one of the tragedies is that if you are wealthy and if you can, you know, afford um, some of the technological solutions, then, or you can afford to migrate to different areas, different countries, then your individual life expectancy might not be affected, you know, but if you are somebody who, relies on, you know, a livelihood that's based on agriculture and outdoor work and, you know, don't have the education so you can take a, a high paying job or you can get air conditioning, you know, I think, yeah, that the, the, your life expectancy is, is likely to suffer. So, so it's hard to say because it's, it will probably depend almost based on who you are as to how um, life expectancy will be impacted, but obviously, None of us can fully, and I think a good demonstration was the wildfires in Canada, where um, you know th that that smoke and um, air pollution spread to to uh, you know all of large parts of North America and rich or poor, you you know couldn't breathe. Um, so I think you know, yeah, yeah, obviously um, we're not all we can't just escape this, uh, and that, and therefore we need to act. But but I'll and I'll leave it there. I see that maybe there's some more chat. But um, one thing to say that the next so that IPCC cycle is now ended. They'll be starting a series of new reports now over the next seven years. But this also includes new climate models. And I mentioned that we have um different scenarios for high projections, low projections, but a lot of these are now also including storylines of what will happen to wealth. So they, they're called the shared socioeconomic pathways and apologies if many of you know this, but the SSPs, there are you know right now five different SSPs that are used, some of which assume that we have reduced inequality and high life expectancy and you know it's all going well and others assume that we as a global world don't learn to collaborate and have trade barriers and you know don't deal with 
um, don't invest in health systems, and they model the impacts um, of different, you know, temperature rise according to these different trajectories. So if any of you are interested in this, I'd suggest you look at the SSP and the different outcomes, because that will really tell you what's going to happen to like life expectancy, for example, in a, a very equal world will be very different from life expectancy in a war, a world which we, you know, have conflict and don't, and don't share, um, you know, scientific resources or knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. So there are some other questions that um, I will ask right now. Um, this one has to do with funding. Is, is funding difficult to secure for emergency response projects? Do countries contribute a certain amount each year? Does the UN request for funding from specific countries, et cetera? I mean, this is really a fairly revolutionary. The anticipatory problem solving is not the usual way the UN or any government uh, that I know of, you know, we don't respond until it's too late after the fact. So congratulations yeah. on pulling that off. But the question about funding is how difficult is it to get money for anticipatory problem solving? Yeah, I mean, I think finance is a huge, that's what I was mentioning, that when you're looking at solutions to whatever problems you're going to be looking at, you know, if you can identify the the financial solutions that actually might unlock a lot of things. Um, so how do we get more finance? And that's on the table right now. You obviously have the like the um, Bridgetown initiative with Mia Motley now meeting with President Macron to discuss, you know, broader reforms to the World Bank and whatnot. But, um, you know, so we know that in the field of climate change, there is not enough money, both for mitigation and for adaptation. We know that in humanitarian finance, while countries are more and more generous, the kind of amount of money countries give for humanitarian action is actually increasing over time, but the needs are also increasing, probably partly because of, of climate change. So we always have this growing gap. Um, so it's, you know, I think part of why anticipatory action began, like what motivated the innovation in this area was that it's cheaper to act in advance. And there's, it didn't show a slide, but we have studies that show you can reach more people for the same amount of money if you, you know, let people preserve their assets and, and kind of protect their development gains rather than destroying it and trying to help people rebuild. So, um, so I'd say, yes, funding is challenging and there are huge shortfalls. And that's why there's just debates right now about how do we, do we have, you know, I don't know, global shipping taxes or airline taxes or special drawing right reallocations are really critical because that's a big, but, um, but we can do more with the money we have by using it in more cost efficient ways. And that's what this is. That's why I mentioned the co-benefits. You can have a solution that has multiple co-benefits. That's all the better um, because the reality is that, you know, um, they're, they're, all governments are really cash constrained right now. So this is a related question uh, having to do with funding. Apart from providing aid to the most affected areas, is there a plan that is put into place to help the people get out of that situation permanently? Yeah, well, I mean, I think certainly, um, and this kind of segues like the SDGs and the kind of, there's one of the challenges is that um, humanitarians are often acting year after year after year in these contexts. And what you do need is a broader development approach. So for the South Sudan context, for example, what likely is needed, we acted last year, we distributed money so that actions could be taken before there literally was a risk of like the dikes breaching. And then you have a hundred thousand people out canoes. It would have been like a disaster scenario. And so we acted early and there, you know, things were reinforced and, but lo and behold, this year, again, there's, there's a, there's still a problem. And the solution is likely, yes, you can try to relocate the camp, but they can't really do that because there isn't really land available. Uh, there isn't really a safe place to go, as I mentioned, because of the other, um, you know, conflict and other crises. And then the other, and right now, obviously in Sudan, you, you have a conflict. So you have people even coming back. Um, but what you really need is to dredge the Nile and have the development funding in there to try to restore that ecosystem so that, but that could take a decade. So I think a lot of the debate right now is not just about the amount of finance or, you know, how do we use the finance effectively with co-benefits, but it's really about how do we layer 
interventions. So um, the kind of layering the uh, humanitarian actors with the development actors, with the climate, like how do we, that kind of coordination, you know, again, if you're looking at solutions, if any of you want to work on solutions to do with coordinating actors, like how do we get the World Bank and the UN to work together <laughs> to effectively coordinate their interventions? That, you know, if somebody can unlock that, that's also a major, a major solution that the world needs today. So. I, I've, there's an, another question, but I've got one at, that I would be uh, kicking myself if I didn't ask it. You are one of the few people on the planet who is as intimately familiar with all of the literature on climate change. I mean, to work on the reports that you've done, uh, you've got to have a fairly well-informed uh, set of ideas and factual, factually based notion of what's going on. So my question is, if you zoom out a little bit from that all that detail, that overwhelming amount of data, and back off looking at the bigger picture of the planet, what do you think is the most important issue or problem? What do you think we ought to do you know, first, if there is such a thing? Maybe we have to do 10 things first, but what is the most important aspect of this from your personal perspective? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. Um... Uh, I mean, maybe, and this might be to some degree, I mean, there's many, I, obviously my PhD, I worked on kind of conservation. And so I could, you know, you could say there's these new global goals of preserving, what is it, 30% of the earth's surface, because that can provide us with ecosystem services. And those are all, you know, fundamental and critical to our development. There's obviously the climate change and mitigating the greenhouse gas emissions, one could say would be the most pressing problem and that we need to do this in the next decade. Otherwise, but, um, so, but, you know, I'll just take from a, a very individual level. I think um, if there, and I mentioned this fact that it's not just the risk, but it's the vulnerability and the exposure and exposure, we have some degree of, maybe it's easier to limit. For example, don't build on coastal areas. You can, you know, um, but the vulnerability, that issue of how do we ensure if we could get everybody to have an education so that they can have, you know, reduce their vulnerability and open up their own, kind of achieve their own capabilities using a March SN's kind of approach, then I think that would help. So we, um, you know, achieve some of those SDGs that actually would help a lot because um, it would reduce vulnerability of, of individuals to some of these shocks because they might be able to choose alternative livelihoods if farming is no longer viable. They might be able to, you know, emigrate or migrate in a safe fashion to a different part of the country or a different country itself. Um, so, so I don't know, I just, uh, speaking from my own family history, my parents were both refugees and looking at where we came from, from, you know, they were living in refugee camps themselves to, to you know, my ability to now uh, be relatively buffered from some of these shocks. And a lot of it's just to do with access to education and, and kind of your own um, individual development. So so I, I'd say that might be something that everybody can benefit from uh, around the world. But they're all, we need to do all everything, that, like that movie, everything everywhere all at once. And that's the problem. <laughs> we need, we need, if we, we do, if we all have good education, but no biodiversity and are living in a four degree world because of greenhouse gas emissions, it's not going to be pleasant for anyone. So, um, There's one last question from uh, somebody. Uh, he's from India. And uh, his question is, our vision of addressing the S SDGs in terms of climate change is optimistic, yet uh, comparatively, uh, the member states of IPCC are in uh, are in implementing um, it, it is its mandate against climate change. What strategies have been designed to see uh, re real change at a uh, grassroots level? Mm -hmm. You know, here here uh, close. Oh, darn it. Um, to, how close are we to bringing, uh, for instance, uh, attention to plastics? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the last question 
the plastic one may not be as important as the first part about how do we get grassroots involvement, but. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the grassroots involvement, um, I think that's obviously critical, particularly given that, you know, if we have, if the nation state based politics isn't functioning um, very collaboratively, uh, then there are still things we can do as regions, like at the regional level, there are things you can do subnationally at the local level that can have tremendous impact and they all add up. So in terms of how does this feed into the global, even in the, the climate negotiations, you have now a local people's community and indigenous platform, LCP, I, know, the, I forget the acronym, but they have a UNFCCC actual stream of work where they try to bring in the local level. Um, and then, uh, you know, in the IPCC as well, um, increasing there's pressure to try to make sure, you know, you, you go as a scientist, you're not representing a government. It is the national government that has to nominate you. So, but they're looking at alternative ways to broaden the diverse pool of individuals who are involved um, so that these like kind of local stories, local knowledge, indigenous knowledge can be used as well. So I'd say that's an area that's um, growing. Um, and I think the local level, local solutions is is really critical. Um, so if you get frustrated by the the global level, focus on the local as well because it does it does play a very important role. And the plastics, yeah, I'll, I'll skip that because I'm not the plastics expert uh, aside from I know that it is obviously of global attention now too. All right. Well, it's it's time for me to do a couple of things. One of which is to thank you for what it is you've just relayed to us. It was informative, it was inspiring, and to be blunt, it's foundational to the work that we're gonna be doing. Uh, all of that information is just of critical importance, and thank you for making your presentation to us at this time. I'm sure there are uh, other things. It's getting late in the day for you. Uh, thank you for all of the work you put into getting here uh, to make the presentation and have a, you know, enjoyable, wonderful uh, evening. Hopefully you'll get some decent food where you are and uh, th thank you again. We really, really appreciate it. Um, I yeah, will thanks. keep you informed as we go forward uh, with what it is these folks come up with. Um, you'll probably see some of 